Well, we're uh, very happy uh, uh, and, and honored today to have Tony Medina, who's professor of creative writing and English at Howard University. Uh, his uh, academic specialties he lists as uh, American literature and African American literature. Uh, he's the author of 17 books for adults and young readers, including Committed to Breathing. I'm, I'm for example, committed to breathing. That's pretty important. Um, Follow-up letters uh, to Santa from kids who never got a response. I and I. Bob Marley. Bob Marley. Bob Marley, yes. I and um, I, Bob Marley. Yes. Uh, my old man was always on the lamb. Uh, <clears throat> broke on ice, uh, an onion of wars, uh, the president looks like me in other poems. Uh, At this uh, one. <laughs> yes. Uh, and his uh, writing has appeared in over 100 publications and a number of CD compilations. He's a winner of multiple awards, including being nominated 2013 for the Pushcart Poetry Prize. Uh, I, I, I encourage you to uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 buy one of his books after the reading. And if you want, uh, you can uh, uh, patronize a local bookstore, Mah Mahogany Books. They get your books uh, to you quickly and uh, they do a good job and it's a support a local bookstore. They're not like, uh, uh, you know, Amazon uh, uh, that's buying up all of America. So uh, uh, take a look at Mahogany Books uh, and, and, and ask. So without any uh, further ado, I turn it over uh, to Tony Medina. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'd like to thank Michael for bringing me out here and uh, Marymount University and everyone who showed up today and who's responsible for this occasion. It's wild to be reading from the crib unless you're surrounded by other poets inside the house and you're having drinks and stuff. But, um, what, what time is the Q&A so I'll know how, how long I go? You, you uh, uh, rough, roughly we go about 40, uh, five, five minutes or so, 40, 45 minutes, and then, and then Q&A. Okay. So, kind so of, uh, would you like to, to, to do it or do you want me to kind of wave at you? <laughs> well, I have a clock around here. You could wave at me as well. Just to let me well, know. I if have you have a, a clock, then go with the clock. I like to, in, in the interest of autonomy, we like to let you choose the, 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 the how things flow. Okay. Usually I do like to, you know, have a couple of open mics or whatever, if anybody wants to read a poem to open it up. Who wants to share something? If not, I'll just jump right in like a lion. Okay. This is the first poem I'm going to read. It looks like this. Um, it's, it's a poem that I wrote coming off of the funeral of a great uh, black, Boricua, black Puerto Rican poet of the New Yorican movement, one of the premier poets of that movement, Tato La Viera in mid Manhattan, um, after his funeral, it was just so incredible because um, it was a celebration of not only um, his life in terms of a poet, but also it brought in everything that makes up um, a Caribbean Spanish speaking poet, you know, from Puerto Rico. And so this is called Dame Un Traguito. And a traguito is a little shot, a little drink. Like, give me a little, give me a little shot. And there's a couple of terms that I use in here. Tecato. Tecato is um, Puerto Rican street slang for a heroin addict. Okay? Dame un traguito para Tato La Viera. It is clear to see that Jesus was a conguero. Beating back bongo skins to his palms, bled blood, shot raw, shot red. No need to put an accent over the E to know who he be. Claro que si. Pam, 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 pam. 
pa 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 kukukulu then he sang back up boogaloo for obatala swore by the hypnotic effects of bolero caught in the throat of a rising sun suddenly sinking atecatos jones coming down on the 110th street in lexington avenue in the crusty eyelash of el barrio that he multiplied wine by sending his little cousin people to cop a few bottles from Beppo's bodega where he kept a muscatel stash just beneath the alabaster statuette of San Lazaro in Bustelo can urn of Doña Chicha's ashes atop the register with the tape faded Polaroids of his pregnant tia in Ponce and his songless tío with the afro the size of Saturn and Sing Sing inked up from head to toe. It's plain to see that Jesus spoke in 4-4 time and Wang Wangko. Then he tapped his dusty, rusty, patent leather sapatos to a rhythm only the children of Africans and Indians understand. Bailando con yema ya, buscando la claridad, singing, el agua limpia todo. Oh, was he born in a manger? Or Morrisania Hospital, the critics will ask their silly questions, like social workers dumb to the reality of the times. But Jesus will pay them no mind, nor will he adhere to the census takers, giving the side eye to tax collectors. The only numbers he cares about come out in New York or Brooklyn, so he could buy his baby a new pair of shoes, so he could walk on water, dry puddle of old wine or piss, or tap his toes trying to mimic the sound of dominoes, click or ring fingers slapping against the stiff neck of beer bottle to one sun-baked viejitos in Guayabera shirts in Panama hat shouting, Manteca! Con cerveza breath, working his arms and legs into a sweat-drenched rum stench, rumba, furious frenzy, as if despojando, saying to no one, and everyone in particular, what he begins to hear reverberating, breakdancing, bomba planting, plena in his inner ear. Fijate! So that brings in a lot of stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh, I write a lot about the homeless, and I actually have three books about the homeless. When I was a kid, growing up in New York City, I had a little spell when my I wanted to be an actor because I was inspired by Al Pacino and Dog Day Afternoon. And so my father was taking me to acting classes in Manhattan on, on Saturdays. And this was the first time that I got away from the projects of Thoreau's Neck in the Bronx. And I just saw these people sleeping on the subways. This is in, in the 70s, right? Um, and I said, who are these people? It was, the it was the dead of winter. And my father would say, you know, those are homeless people. And I was just so shocked because I couldn't believe that anyone could live out in the streets uh, in, in the winter. And so I was affected by that all my life, homelessness and stuff like that. So I created this character named Broke. And Broke just took on a persona of his own, like Langston Hughes's simple character. And I have three books, and one of them is called Broke Baroque. And so the title poem is called Broke Baroque. I was a lucky stiff, stuffed in a garbage bag with a day glow toe tag the size of Winnebago, parallel parked against the callus so thick and red. You'd swear it was a blowhard right-wing televangelist screaming, holy Jesus, hell or high water, about the end of the world in the second coming of Earl of Burl Hives, of Burl Ives on Fifth Avenue and 34th Street. Oblong objects have always been my Achilles heel. It's no wonder I heard a squeal when the orderly tried to put me in the freezer but couldn't get past my ankle that got rankled in the coroner's report. He said I was left for dead in the slums of Calcutta, in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, in the tombs of Timbuktu, in the wounds of South Bronx fumes and Biloxi blues, on a nowhere man cruise. My head was a cardboard box 
my liver and anthill of the savannah. Manna from heaven so hard nearly knocked me upside down, but I survived with my wits about me. A roguish lout going toe to toe with the best of them. From the ass end of a bottle of, a, of cheap perfume, drunk off the flames of fruit of the looms, where to, my, where to my surprise I surmise the cries of wine resides in a dark alley in broad daylight, tapping the bottle for residue. This is how my pulse was taken in exchange for bacon. They say the pool would make prime choice ribs. Tell that to Eve when you see her. So I teach at Howard University. And one day, um, I like to have my, my students sit around in a circle in the classroom. And one afternoon, this, this girl was sitting 12 o'clock to my six o'clock. And I don't know why, but she had a, a kind of a scowl on her face. And I was like, you're too young to have a scowl. And so that, whole idea of a scowl <laughs> led to this poem and this poem just literally just unraveled onto its own it's called blue scowl obad and the obad is one of those uh poems that are uh for unrequited love blue scowl obad she wore a scowl on her face like foundation and mascara Smearing into ruby red lips, the color of Dorothy slippers, gone to take her home with a click. Only her ghost with their bent twist and the mustache frown, like a clown down on his luck, buried beneath bills and faded thrills, beneath pink slips and slip banana peel backflips of Vicodin, Sin, and Gin. Not the proper tonic, but a buzz that'll do to beat back the flies with dry, harsh howling breath. Even the wind despised, disguised in grief, in a blues. So old and familiar, she walked the streets in, cold stairs swirling from lampposts and pavements, speckled with dirty gum and broke glass shards, twinkly-eyed as if the cement drank rum. She found it hard to get high. The numb feeling seating like a from her foolish shore. Love done gone and split, done packed its bags like a guitar in the hands of a blues man, rolling out of town on a midnight freight, hauling him off like a bucket full of pain wrapped in Ziploc bags, all she ever had. Her life caught it from corner to corner, rattling around on squeaky wheel heels. What she concealed in the coat, someone left draped over her like a quilt or cape she could not escape beneath an uptown L as she slumbered restlessly on cardboard splayed out on concrete and cold. Her world reduced to oil stains and piss smells, some wino left trying to drown out an Aunt's Dawn song. Clumps of newsprint torn out black and white photos, the yellowed pages of outdated copy stuffed her like a turkey to keep her warm and basting for the taking the plucking of dirty pigeons that shat on her sleeping statue of flesh torn out holes in pants and shoes howling at indiscriminate rats rolling like gangbangers who just don't give a fuck gonna get what's theirs madhood like all the men in her life taking what they could Okay, and I don't know, for some reason, um, some stuff came in there from when I was a high school kid and I would take, I, I was living in Co-op City in the Bronx at this time, <clears throat> and I would go to the, um, take the um, Pelham Bay Park train station, the number six train at the, at the last stop, to go to school. And one morning I saw this old, um, it was a homeless, old white woman sitting on the ground on cardboard you know in the middle of the winter and she was cursing everybody out uh who was going back and forth to work or whatever in school and so when i came back she was still there and i was like disturbed i went home i told my grandmother about it and she gave me her her dress coat the one that she used to go to the hospital to to 
to church, you know, to appointments. And so I went over and I draped it over her while she slept on that cardboard that night. The next morning, she had the, the, um, uh, the coat wrapped around her waist sitting up and she was smiling, but she wasn't cursing anybody out. So uh, some of those um, images came into that poem about this homeless woman, basically, you know, and how she got there. And so you just never know where a poem is going to take you and where it's going to go. And what in your subconscious is going to just like uh, make its way in there, insinuate its way. The next piece I'm going to read comes from an incident that took place <clears throat> um, a couple of years ago. And in New York City, when Trump unleashed all these ICE agents on people, this um, teenage girl, I think she was like about 13 or maybe 12, she was going to school with her father and these, you know, this incident took place and the girl was hysterical. And I just, store that in my psyche and I, I just knew I had to write about it. And one, when this anthology called We Rise and Resist, We Raise Our Voices came about and I was supposed to submit to it, I wrote this, you know, uh, when they gave me a, re a warning to hurry up and submit. And it's called One Day Papi Drove Me to School. And it's illustrated beautifully by this artist, Idel Rodriguez. And if you can see that, it's gorgeous, right? One day, Papi drove me to school. <clears throat> One. One day, Papi drove me to school like he always does, talking about my homework, science, history, and math. He made a funny face when I told him all I had to add. Lots of kids were in front of the building, and others were being dropped off. I turned to Papi to ask him, will you pick me up after school? And before I knew it, four cops came running toward him. I heard a commotion, looked to my right and screamed, Papi, Papi. I saw my Papi go down to the ground, tackled and shackled and hands cuffed behind his back. I could not see Papi's face. The cop with his knee on Papi's back smashed it into the pavement as he grabbed a fistful of Papi's hair. All I could see were Bobby's jeans and his construction boots. I screamed. The world started to sweep from beneath my feet and buildings started to tumble and I nearly had an asthma attack from my constant screams. One cop, a woman with the word ice on her back, pulled me by my waist as I flailed and kicked in desperation. Students, parents, and some teachers crowded around as the officers held me to the ground while my papi was pushed into a police van. La migra, la migra, someone yelled. Others laughed with their fat fish faces, taunting me with alien and illegal and get out and go back to your country. I shouted, this is my country, you stupid doofus heads. Before I knew it, a crowd of white kids surrounded me but other kids, black and brown and some white, came to my rescue. Somehow, though, I was the one who was taken to the principal's office. Two. Now the school was split in half. A crazy group of kids wore Make America Great Again hats just to taunt us. But others, black, brown, and white kids, were down with us and not racism. In all my nine years on the planet, I never had a fight, but a handful of kids wanted to start trouble. One day, they scrunched up their faces and balled up their fists. We stepped forward in unison. We took off our jackets and our sweaters and dropped them to the ground. Then we stuck out our chests real proud so they could see our t-shirts that read, I am not an alien. I am not illegal. Why don't you go back to your country? Not my favorite song. God is not my name. No more borders. No more walls. Three. The bullies backed down that day and moved on to their classrooms. The next day, the Make, 
the Make America Great Again hats had disappeared. Instead, some kids asked, where can I get the cool t-shirts? We didn't get any more glares or stares. One of the boys who bullied me even came up to me and, and said, my mom's a lawyer, she can help your dad. And as we walked to our class, he turned to me, guess what? I said, what? I'm just like you. I gave him the side eye and answered back, a girl? He laughed and I laughed and then he said, my father's from Croatia. Four. That will make the perfect ending for a movie, but this is real life. And they took my papi away. And once again, the world was swept from under my feet and mommy's. She has to find a new job to help take care of us and help get papi back. One day, my papi drove me to school, a day I'll never forget. I get sad and scared when I think about where papi is. I keep his photo in the gold locket he gave me last Christmas. I keep it pressed tight and close to my heart. <clears throat> Send Rayu for Trayvon Martin. Skittles back, pockmarked, holy bleeds in rain puddle. Hoodie hides no blood, tears or eyes shut by wet grass, screens pierce night sky, a father's stomach pits, my boy, my boy, shot through sky, skittles like Roman candle bursts blood from open chests, stars squint and stare, raindrops glare and moonlight witnessing bloodletting, Morning grass like wet face of boy screaming bloody murder. Gunpowder blinds the eye of justice reckless as a dumb vigilante. Silence of blood clouds night drizzle where wind whistles through hole in can. Empty bag of Skittles, crushed can of iced tea, last game with father. Rain chews night air, gnaws at brown boy flesh, grinning teeth of bullets. Rain stains brown boy's back as blood pours from chest, turning the green grass red. How blues is born. Rain falls steady on dead end street strewn with black body. Mama's cries hang on rain hooks, ornamenting night winds grin blood petals pock grim face of grass like lotus on red slick back of black boy i've played back butterburn cries to peace my boy back <clears throat> This poem, I wrote it, um, waking up from a dream the night after Freddie Gray was killed. And it takes into consideration this notion of um, the magic Negro. And it conflates another incident that took place where a young man, a young black male was handcuffed behind his back in the back of a patrol car and he was shot point blank in his chest and the coroner's report ruled it a suicide. From the crushed voice box of Freddie Gray. I am the magic Negro, the black Houdini who done it, done it to himself. I handcuffed my own damn self. I threw myself in the back of the patrol car, my hands shackled behind my back, slave ship cargo ago. I am the magic Negro, the black Houdini, who done it, do's it to himself, him black self. See ma, no hands. 
I snatched a pistol from the white man's mind from the back of the patrol car. Suck on this, Houdini. I grab the gun and shoot myself in the chest, neo-colonial style. The autopsy report says, damn, would have been easier to walk on water. I bet you a quarter he done shot himself. I am the magic Negro, spineless. I broke my own spine after hog tying myself into a pretzel. Even Houdini, who done it, would envy. Only to turn myself into a human pinball rattling around the steel gullet of a Negro pickup truck once reserved for newly arrived potato famine New York Irish drunks down on their luck. Me, moi, it is I who was a fellow. Oh, hell no. Yes, me, the magic Negro, the black Houdini, who done it, does it all the time to himself, his own damn self. Okay, so I wrote this um, graphic novel called I Am Alfonso Jones, which is about a 16-year-old boy from the Bronx in Harlem who, in the process of buying his first suit, to wear for his father's release from prison, who was exonerated on DNA testing for rape and murder, um, is mistaken, you know, the wire hanger he's holding his hand is mistaken for a gun, and he's shot and killed by the security guard, who's also a police officer. And um, in this scene that I'm gonna read, explores what the mother goes through, what the parent goes through in these times, particularly when the death is on a 24 seven loop, basically around the clock in the mass media. It's, um, this part is called Born to Trauma. He was my miracle boy, the one who didn't make it. Every time he left the house, I prayed. You don't know what the mother goes through. Dreamt I ripped that cop's eyes out. Screamed and swung and scratched at his face and woke in a sweat, screaming, what have you done? What have you done? What have you done to my beautiful baby boy? I'm not gonna let you turn my son's death into a reality show episode every few weeks, every so many months, another black body at the hands of white police, black police, any old police. Here you come again, trying to parade us around TV to cry on cue, cry out for a justice we never get. We're not going to let you make a circus of our pain. Our black misery is not for your white amusement. Why do you think I fought to get my son into Henry Dumas? Because it was a school that was created from grassroots organizing and did not depend upon a curriculum that excluded his reality. Had that damn security guard cop, Officer Whitson, went to a school whose books reflect white mind had movies, TV, whatever reflected that, maybe he would have seen my son as a teenager, as a person, as a citizen, as an American, as a human, and not something to be so easily, so rapidly, so wistfully disposed of. His girlfriend said, he shot my baby like a deer, like a deer. And all he was doing was buying his first suit. All he was doing was trying on a damn suit. I guess you got what you wanted. Hmm. Let's see if we can make it through. 
This is the introduction to a book that I did while at the same time I was writing the graphic novel. It's called 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Boy. Black boys scrape their knees. They bleed. Black boys cry and scream. They, ca they tackle life like air, gliding on wind, basking in the breeze. Black boys sit beneath trees, inhale fresh cut grass and dream. Black boys play with building blocks, are fascinated by clocks, cradle skateboards under their arms. Black boys love basketball and books, toss footballs and leaf through pages lost in stories and myths. Black boys love comic books and superheroes, are heroes to little sisters and brothers. Black boys love popcorn and watching movies, love their grandmas and grandpas. Black boys hug and kiss their moms and emulate their dads. Black boys wear their daddy's shoes and ties, wear smear shaving cream on their smooth faces, giggling in steamy mirrors. Black boys shine bright in sunlight, build snowmen and have snowball fights. Black boys study the stars, looking through telescopes, lie on their backs in tall grass, staring at the blanket of blue sky, at all the eyes smiling and twinkling down on them. Black boys like to hum and drum, bebop, hip hop, like to dance and sing, jazz and scream. Black boys are three dimensions of beauty. Black boys go to church, ride buses, go to school, sit on stoops, fly kites, shoot hoops. Black boys like to sit in there quiet and think about things. Black boys are made of flesh, not clay. Black boys have bones and blood and feelings. Black boys have minds that thrive with ideas like bees around a hive. Black boys are alive with wonder and possibility, with hopes and dreams. Black boys be bouquets of tonka bunched up like flowers. They be paint blotched into a myriad of colors across the canvases of our hearts. We celebrate their preciousness and creativity. We cherish their lives. I'm right, I'm winding down now. <laughs> this is called Double Dare. Was the cop kneeling on George Floyd's neck as he lay gasping for his last breath, praying to his white Jesus? Was he taking a knee to shine a light on police brutality? Was he brutal? when he rocked back and forth like a hobby horse applying pressure? Did the rocking make him think about his childhood as he, as he, as, like, think about his childhood? Was he daydreaming with one hand in his pocket, cowboy ritual applying more and more pressure as George Floyd managed to cry out for his dead mother, I can't breathe, please, your knee is on my neck, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Was he caught up in his childhood days, magically thinking he was back on that dime store horse or on top of his Amy Cooper or Karen or any old Becky Bronco breaking from his past, aggressively groping, applying all that pressure as pedestrians pleaded with him to stop, to stop, to stop? Did the cop get his rocks off as he rocked back and forth until George Floyd was no longer pleading? Did he enjoy taunting George Floyd's limp flesh as a piss stream leaked out his black body along, his, along with his last breath when the lynch mob photo op gleam in his eyes whispered to a dead George Floyd, get up, get up, get up, as if a dare, a double dare, or a simple dime storm memory, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up. <coughs> How it will finally come to an end. Trump on the toilet like Elvis, mainlining dry brief burgers and hydroxychloroquine. Melania in the Lincoln bedroom, dousing it with Lysol and Clorox to mask the smell emanating from the bathroom. 
An alarm is tripped. Secret service can be heard managing muffled screams of if need in the nuts. A sniper on the roof can be heard yelling as he falls into a burning bush. Protesters have breached the White, White House fence. Flames are everywhere. Trump doesn't even have time to wipe his ass or send up one last tweet before he falls on his bloated face with a turd the size of a 1973 Buick sticking out his ass. Melania rushes in with a PPE mask and is suddenly overcome by her husband's obnoxious fumes. She can only manage a be best between coughs. Trump is yelling to her to help him get the Lincoln log out of his ass as his face orange smears the cold white tiles. As Melania struggles with the turd cemented in her donkey's ass, protesters have lit the white, white House on fire. It resembles a tulip of flames. Melania finally comes to her senses and drags Trump by the turd in his lace front. She manages to drag his fat ass down the stairs, but is met by elves donning MAGA hats, singing, Oh, oh, Antifa. We could make it together. Melania, watching shit go up in flames, weighs her options, grabs a few furs, her jewelry, and Trump's credit cards, and leaves him to be turned into a hobby horse for the MAGA elves. She chunks up the deuces to Trump crying and blubbering like a bloated baby and says, be best, and bounces with the last and loneliest Secret Service agent left standing. In the last poem, to give you some relief. <clears throat> In Venice, dolphins swim the canals. In Venice, dolphins swim the canals as LA skies are crystal ball clear, predicting the coming of the cicadas and DC's cherry blossoms opening early like pastel debutante umbrellas. The streets are empty. Everyone is sheltered in as a virus rages like Ralph Ellison, invisible to the naked eye, while a naked ape, an orange idiot, Sans the Savant, is babbling about it being a hoax, a hoax, it's all a hope, telling us from the White White House, don't believe your lying eyes as refrigerated trucks in Brooklyn stockpile bodies in freezers like popsicles. This agent orange menace is a virus unto himself, as racism is, as stupidity is, in a country where Confederate statues are more visible than common sense. A virus named after a cheap piss water beer, this menace barks, China, China. China, as if repulsed by his wife's vagina. At a press conference, he bogarts the mic from the experts who know more about science than he knows about stealing, telling us hydroxychloroquine malaria pills are good as Tic Tacs at fighting bad breath. He should know, and if that doesn't work, you could spray down your tongue with Lysol or belt back some Clorox to crank your box. In Venice, dolphins swim the canals free of debris, while here, black joggers are hunted by fathers and sons in a rite of passage Jim Crow outdoor trailer trash parlor game as Amy or Karen or Becky with the bad brain scream hysterically into cell phones at 911 operators in their worst Stanislavski method acting, like the black birder is a mockingbird, while an essential worker EMT cannot get any PPE. Instead, she got eight bullets into her bone-tired sleeping body in a 21-gun salute to T.S. Eliot with a side of side eye because May is the cruelest month, especially during a lockdown where racism and hate are never quarantined, yet a black man remains a stepping stool for a white man's knee who drummed out Colin Kaepernick as if a flag takes precedence over a black life. And I just want to end with this one last one. <clears throat> it's called Stefan Clark. It opens with a quote from Harriet Ann Jacobs. There are wrongs which even the graves does not bury. There will be time enough for blood and petals peeled from overfled flesh 
late night stroll patrolling the petunias in grandma's garden. No need for patios light haloed by flies. Spider webs and moths flailing away as if drowning in midair. Oh, who could tell in all that dark grass shifting beneath flat feet? Who could tell the silhouette in the dark frame by starlight in distant windows? Who could tell a body from a target study at night? There'll be time enough for blood blooming petals pierced with lead fed flesh. The sin in the garden of breathing of being black in all that black. What falls is not paradise, but 12 bullet shells, the rest buried in the back, dislodged out the chest, blooming petals of blood in the garden, in the garden of no more breathing, of blackness leaving. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that reading. Um, everyone, audience, if you have questions, please ask. Um, anything about the poems that you've heard today or, ah, Jordan. Yeah, I just had a quick question for you, Mr. Medina. Um, you mentioned uh, one of your poems, you came out of a dream and were inspired to write it. Does that happen to you often? Uh, meaning, are you often inspired to write poetry from waking up from a dream or, or some type of experience like that? It does. It's, um, I think it's the way the, my mind works and it processes things. That's why, if you notice, a lot of these poems are like social, socially uh, relevant. I mean, I write personal poems too. And, and My Old Man is Always on the Lamb is basically a memoir in verse. But um, it's the way I deal with stuff. I remember when I, um, I wrote the, uh, the, la the second to last poem I read, and, um, the one about the dolphins in Venice and stuff. And I read it to my aunt over the phone. She lives in New York in the Bronx. And she said, that's the way, <laughs> that's the way you deal with this stuff. You know, she didn't want me to go out to the protests and go crazy and stuff, of course, with the pandemic and everything. Oh, and she didn't want me to get in trouble. So she was like, I'm just glad that you have poetry <laughs> to be able to, to, to process all this stuff. But yeah, I think it's the same for a lot of writers, a lot of artists, they, things come to them in a dream. The brain is always working, as you know. Even when we're sleeping, it's, it's like figuring things out. <laughs> so you just have to have um, a notepad handy, you know, and a pen, always on, on, on your person or at the nightstand. Definitely, awesome. always have that pen ready. <laughs> um, Faith had a question for you. Um, I don't think it's really a question, but um, I love the fact um, that a lot of your poems had to do with what's going on uh, today. Um, I was really trying to keep myself together um, because I really started to, to cry um, because of all of the stuff that is going on. And I'm a Black woman myself, you know, so, um, you know, it just, your words you know, just kind of like we're punching me, but like a good punch, you know, um, but it just, it just really, um, you know, breaks my heart to, to know that, you know, my people are going through this, you know, but um, it's, it's also good to know that people, um, you know, of other backgrounds are aware of what's going on, and they're not blind to this, so I appreciate it, and um, it was just, it was just really, um, really and it's making me hot like really really uh helpful um but i i just really appreciate it thank you i mean you know basically faith uh i've been writing about this stuff forever <laughs> ever since i started writing you know what i mean so i mean i come from the hood i come from the projects i you know i'm black i'm puerto rican i'm caribbean i'm all these things right so and i'm a human being and i'm american and um a person I'm a veteran as well, but I, I have to just, I, you know, I'm dealing with injustice on every level that I could think of. Um, right. But yeah. to do it in poetry is, um, you know, you got to have that art aspect in there. You can't just, you know, just put out rhetoric and speeches and stuff like that. 
It's got yeah. to be that balance between the aesthetic and what you're trying to say. Yeah. You know, like Bob Marley says, say something. Right. So, uh, you know, heroes are people who speak out, who bear witness, as James Baldwin said, you know. Um, but yeah. I've been, I have enough, I have a whole collection that's coming out, basically, of all of my, literally all of my police brutality poems for like 20 plus years that I've been writing. And that's just like insane, you know. Yeah. The graphic and novel did a lot of stuff. Right. And, you know, to know that, um, you know, uh, one of the poems that you wrote, you know, after waking up, I thought um, I thought about God and then I thought about all the people, you know, who were killed from, you know, uh, police brutality. And, and I was just saying, you know, in my mind, some way that they're um, speaking through you, you know, so to yeah. know that you woke up off of that and, okay, I'm going to write today, you know, so, you know, maybe they were speaking <laughs> to you, you know, through that dream. So I thought that was cool. Don't get it twisted. I'd be on social media going crazy, ranting and raving. And then the poem comes. The poem mm -hmm. works itself out. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, literally, I swear, I woke up and the poem just, it was born. It was just coming right out, you know, like a baby. I just had to just, you know, write it down. I was a vessel. Yeah, Faith, faith might be onto something there. Um, I think poems often do, or poets often feel that poems are speaking through them. Um, in such interesting ways. Uh, Darian, it's, in black, it's, it's in the black tradition. Yeah. This notion of being a vessel. And, you know, as if you could, if you look at, you know, the, one of the first poems I read, Dame un Targuito, that talked about, you know, Obatala and, and, and Santaria, and, mm -hmm. which is basically, you know, from the Nigerian um, Yoruba. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff, you know, the ancestors that come out in I Am Alfonso Jones, you know, we're constantly, you know, we don't see a dividing line between the living and the dead, basically, you know. That's where magical realism comes from. It comes from the notion of culture where, you know, <laughs> your grandmother wakes up and say, yeah, some, such and such came to me, you know, as a ghost, you know, as a spirit and told me this. And so go and play this number for me, <laughs> you know. That's a wonderful idea. Um, Darius had a question for you. Um, so uh, thank you for um, coming and reading to us today. And kind of like Faith, mine isn't much of a question, but um, when you were, when in your poem, when you said black boys like comic books, I was like, that's me, because <laughs> I love comics. And like, I'm just a big comic nerd. And you know, Chad B Chadwick Boseman just died not too long ago, like very recently. He went to so Howard. That hit home for me. You're a spirit. So thank and you. The, the thing about that poem, Darius, and I want to give a shout out to, to Sasha Orange over there. <laughs> the thing about that poem is that I didn't want to write I didn't like, I don't like the notion of having to exclaim your humanity and saying, why are you treating me like this? I'm a human, I'm a human. No, let me show you who I am, what I am. And that's what that poem is about. You know, black boys scrape their knees, they bleed. They actually bleed like everybody else. You know, they feel pain. And this notion of, you know, um, the magic Negro that you could just, just like, you know, no. You're talking about human beings with feelings and imagination, and dreams and thoughts. And this is what we're doing to each other. You know, it's like that Langston Hughes uh, poem, I Too Am America, where, you know, they, they, they're relegating him to sit in the back in the kitchen to eat and not with everybody else. And he said, one day you're going to really feel shame because I'm beautiful and I'm intelligent. And you're going to really feel really ashamed that you did this to me. Because when you dehumanize somebody, you're actually dehumanizing yourself because we're all connected in humanity. And that's just the way it goes. So that's what that poem is really about. To celebrate. And it doesn't just go to black boys. Of course, black girls too. You know, black women are getting killed by the police and other means. And, you know, and we need to recognize that. 
And I have some poems on black women being brutalized. As you see in that, uh, for, um, the George Floyd poem, you know, I, I mentioned, I don't mention her, but it's Breonna, you know, Taylor that I'm talking about um, in that poem. I'm referencing, you know, she was, she was literally killed like um, Fred Hampton, the revolutionary in Chicago, sleeping uh, with his wife and his baby. And ironically enough, I read with his son as he was an adult, but shot when he was laying down and sleeping in his bed. That's exactly how this um, EMT essential worker was killed, sleeping in her bed, bone tired from trying to save people's lives and comfort them during a, a global pandemic. Yep. Um, I have a little bit of a different question for you from Cecilia. She wants to know how you deal with writer's block. You deal with writer's block by not believing in writer's block, by not succumbing to it. All you got to do is keep feeding yourself. I remember reading um, an interview one time when Toni Morrison talked about, she said, I don't believe in writer's block. She said, you know why? Because when I'm thinking about the story, I consider that to be writing. That was just the most brilliant thing, you know? Like, just thinking about the story or trying to fix a plot point or whatever, or, or a poem in your mind, thinking is also writing. At some point, you just gotta work it out in your head and then write it down. So, uh, if you find yourself being blocked, and, and this happens because you're stressed, you're overworked, you may be a student, you may, you know, find yourself just not even having the time, a parent or something like that. You just feed yourself little by little. You read poems, you read short stories, you um, look at art, you take stuff in, you take a lot of stuff in. And eventually, like a sponge that you pour water into, little by little, it's gonna overflow. And that overflow is your muse. And be ready to write that down. You know, jot down your ideas. Thinking is writing, as Toni Morrison put it. Yeah, I love that idea. That's fantastic. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I have a question. Oh, yes. Go ahead. So um, I've been writing for a while, and there is obviously a lot going on in our world right now, and I belong to the disabled population. And we, in particular, cannot go to those rallies because a lot of us are already at risk or there isn't a way for us to safely get away. If the police escalate, someone who is blind could easily be injured and not know that it was coming, or someone in a wheelchair might not be able to get up onto the sidewalk and get away. Someone who's deaf might not hear the warnings and might be attacked. And so in some of my pieces that I've had to keep to myself, when I have shown them to other people, they have said that they are angry or that they aren't doing any work because that work isn't caught in a photograph on a street. Instead, it's on paper in someone's house waiting to be seen. What would you say to these people and how do you deal with those attitudes towards your own works that might be difficult for other people to reconcile with? That's a good question, Allison. And you know what, Allison? The struggle takes everybody on every level. It's not just people marching on the streets, it's people at every level doing something. So by virtue of you making art, by virtue of you speaking out, by virtue of you um, speaking out in a classroom or in a meeting or even on social media and sharing your ideas and your information, you are in the struggle, you are activated, you are doing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're alive, and the fact that you're uh, sensitive to all this stuff and you are speaking out about it and you are making uh, art about it, you're writing about it, uh, all of that is valid and it's all part of the struggle. And we need everybody on every level. Not everybody is going to be able to take to the streets. Like this past summer when we had the Black Lives Matter marches and stuff like that in the midst of the pandemic, everybody couldn't make it onto the street because, you know, you know I'm an asthmatic. I, I couldn't I couldn't get out there. A lot of people I know have all these conditions. We didn't we didn't really know how this how vicious this um this uh, virus is. It's, it's novel, right? It's new. It's new to the human 
to the human world. So whatever you do, don't even, don't even let these people rent space in your mind. You know what I mean? The hell with them. You do what you do. Because that's what, you're a revolutionary. She is, actually. Um, we have a, another question from Marnell. Cool. Hey, Tony. So I, um, I've got two degrees from Howard, so I appreciate you um, being here. Did we meet before? Because you look familiar to me. Uh, you know, I, this is a long time ago, so I'm not sure. <laughs> well, we could chat. You look like one of my former students, Mia. <laughs> I probably not, <laughs> but I, um, so I, I, first of all, I really appreciate you um, being able to come to our campus and speak with our students. I'm wondering. Um, Michael's, that's Michael's fault. <laughs> but you know, so I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned earlier, I think in response to one of um, maybe Faith's question, uh, you mentioned like your multiple identities, depending on how you want to, you know, define identities, right? My ultimate identity is black. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, I say that, too, because both of my parents are from the Caribbean. And so I get that. I'm wondering how you make sense of that when you're writing, um, because, you know, many of the movements are from African-American perspective. Many, if you're talking about Puerto Rico, if you're talking about um, the Caribbean, um, how do you make sense of the multiple struggles? Because although they can be considered one mass struggle, there are also these um, <clears throat> very, very different struggles if you want to get into what Blackness represents. So is that heavier? For, I have multiple questions, really. But is that heavier for you since you have these multiple intersecting identities, number one? And then number two, do you feel as if you have to choose as you're writing or are you just kind of writing from what you feel? Um, and then what would you recommend for, um, you know, anyone who is struggling with how they see themselves if they do have these multiple identities, if they feel as if maybe they don't fit in. And I'm saying this because I went to Howard and at Howard, you know, you've got so many different types of black people. Yeah. Outside of Howard, people don't see that or notice that. Well, you know, that's such a- We're all the same, question. essentially. And so if you could talk about that, I'm really interested in hearing your response. That's such a, a great question because it's heavy and it really is in my wheelhouse. And it goes to what I was trying to do consciously with I Am Alfonso Jones. And when I, when I created the character, and I think, you know, Alfonso is kind of like a redundancy of blackness because his mother is Puerto Rican and his father's African-American, right? So there's a redundancy of blackness there because if you look at what a Puerto Rican is, the whole base of the Puerto Rican culture is African. Everything is African. The music, the food, the religion, everything, right? And the genetics, uh, you know, African and Taino, which is the indigenous of the island. The thing is that I wanted to make uh, Alfonso Jones have a mother who's Puerto Rican, a father who's African American. I wanted to blend the Santeria of the mother coming from, you know, her Puerto Rican culture and the African-American Black Liberational Church. The African-American Black Liberational Church aspects and put them together because I wanted people to have a broader idea of what Blackness is. Blackness is just not relegated to African-American. Blackness is three-fourths of the planet. And that's what I was trying to do. And I think that that question is important because people don't understand that. You know what I mean? So I consciously identify as what, you know, when I look at my grandmother who passed, of course, uh, you know, <laughs> I just go by what I look like, what I am, what my family look like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, come on, we're all the products of the, 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 the original sin of slavery and stuff, you know? The fact that a lot of us don't embrace that reality and they rather embrace Europe, you know, and you see in the language Latino, Latinx, or Latina, and Hispanic, all those things are wrong. All those things are not even exact. 
you got to go back to the source. And Africa is the original source. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Yes. Yes. You know, I also believe in the power to name oneself. So, you know, I think that not being part of the Latinx population, you know, for me personally, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would make that argument because I feel like they should be able to name themselves. However, you're right in terms of blackness. Like I do see those multiple identities, those differing identities. Um, and, and, and you have the privilege of, of being able to, um, to work at Howard and see like the multiple identities of blackness and hear students saying that. And, um, and so I really appreciate you sharing that with us and, and your but poems. You come well. on out. The thing about the naming is important because I don't subscribe by those names because I don't want somebody naming me. Right. You know, I don't understand what that is. That's not, that's not specific enough for me. Latino, Latina, Latinx. Wait, who, who came up with that? I didn't come up with it. So, you know, in the tradition of Audre Lorde, you got to name yourself. Audre Lorde had a thousand handles <laughs> for who she was. <laughs> she was very specific. You know what I mean? I hear you. So you got to be specific. And she broke it down. She has about five identities and stuff that she merged together as one. So I'm in, I'm in the tradition of Audre Lorde. Do we have any other questions for Tony Medina? Anyone else want to ask any or any final thoughts? What does your revision you. process look like? My revision process? Woo! Yes. Oh, it, it, it varies. In the beginning, I was like, you know, a beat head in a sense of, you know, first thought, best thought, like Allen Ginsberg was talking about in the, in the beat generation poets. Um, and as you get older, as you deal with editors and stuff like that, you find that there's ways of, you know, maneuvering stuff and changing stuff and making it stronger. So it varies. I, I'm not sure. Sometimes the poem will come out and it'll just be perfect the way it is, just born like that. And other times, you know, you might want to tweak it, go back to it and do that stuff like that. I just don't think that people should overdo it, you know, over polish or shine to the point of making something disappear or being too uh, paralyzed by it. I don't really like the MFA model because a lot of people, they leave an MFA program and they can't write on their own. They always need other people. You know, you got to learn to be, you know, trust your instincts. You know, like Ernest Hemingway talked about having a built-in shit detector. You got to have that built-in shit detector. You know, of course you bounce it off of some people here and there, but sometimes you just got to be, you know, stick to your guns sometimes. Don't be narrow-minded when you're dealing with other uh, um, objective opinions and stuff like that. But when you, you know, you have strong instincts and your instincts nine times out of 10 are right. Does that make sense? Yes. I like That's these cool. questions. Yeah, they've been great questions. Oh, Darius has his hand up again. Okay, cool. Um, in your second poem, you mentioned um, Biloxi Blues. Was that um, Biloxi, Mississippi? Yes. I used to live down there. So when you said that, I was like, hey. And there's, a, um, there's probably a song called Biloxi Blues and there's a movie, uh, Neil Simon, you know, Biloxi Blues and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, you use a lot of references that are multi-layered sometimes, but yeah. I, it's Mississippi because you wanna, that poem is talking about all over the place, you know, it's like this broke represents, you know, people impoverished and made homeless all over the place. I mean, I don't think, there should be homelessness in the world, you know, with two uh, wealthier species for homelessness to exist. Um, I don't even think there should be that many people behind bars. I mean, this is, it's just insane what's happening. Um, and the global community should be one where we're working together and sharing more. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, because I'm a criminal justice major and a social minor, so I'm kind of like, okay, like I got it, you know. Darius, are you related to the pink knees? Hmm. Are you related to the to the pink knees in the um, children's book world? No, <laughs> I did meet him though. He came to my one? school once. Um, he wrote Who's a, that. Um, he wrote a children's book. It's um, it had something to do with a seahorse. I can't remember the name of it right now. But all my classmates were like, "You guys you might have want to name." Him. You might want to check your uh, your roots. You might be related to the Pinkneys, and they're like a dynasty in children's literature. <laughs> Um, my last name is in the encyclopedia, though, because of my great grandfather. So he was one of the first was? people in South Carolina to own a large plot of land. So, wow! You know what I mean? Um, Forty acres and a mule was always denied. That's why Spike Lee keeps reminding people: <laughs> Forty acres and a mule. We never got that. That's what he said. African Americans never got that. Nope. So your grandfather's like a pioneer, basically, in that sense. Yeah, I did not know that about you, Darius. That's really cool. Um, yeah, my mom brings it up all the time, and I'm like, I, I know, mom. I bet she does. I kind of want to hear more at some point. Um, hey, Darius, that's your project. You that's your project, that. Darius. Um, Allison has another her hand up again. You have another question, Allison? Yes, sorry. I'm full of Allison questions likes. today. Um, unfortunately, there's been a long trail of moments where justice did not occur, when it obviously blatantly should have. And it isn't restricted to just someone who is Black. It also happens to the disabled community. We still haven't gotten justice for a fatal police shooting in 2016 in Oklahoma City. And like it, it happens over and over and over again. But what are your thoughts on the idea that if we cannot get justice from the court system or from the justice system, that we can get justice through literature, that we can almost like a court of public opinion, dig in and put an idea of this happened, this is not okay, this is something that will be remembered this way, even if the people who should have granted that justice failed to. What are your thoughts? About memorializing it and putting it into um, art? About get... taking the idea of justice out of the courts when they fail to render it in a different way that may actually live on longer than the court's opinion does. Well, if you look at our, our history and you look at literature, you look at art, music, there's always uh, people bearing witness. When you look at um, John Coltrane's, um, you know, Alabama song or um, anything by James Baldwin, basically, or Baraka or Sonia Sanchez, you know, it's constantly Bob Marley, you know, Langston Hughes, on and on and to break it down. The artist is constantly um, depicting what's happening and bearing witness. But we do need justice. We need actual justice. You know, we need, we need to change the system. We need to have, um, we need to get out and vote. I can't wait to vote on the 26th in Maryland, uh, you know, early. We need to get these people out of office. We need to get a lot of these Republicans out of the Senate, you know, there shouldn't be a uh, hearing that's taking place right now as we speak. Um, Affordable Care Act is going to be killed. So many people are going to be, uh, are going to suffer and they're going to, are going to perish because they want to take away so much. And the Republicans basically represent the corporations. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. They should be re representing the people. But I just don't understand. They get they're big money from the corporations, and so they do their bidding. But the people have to recognize that. When you look at uh, the majority of these people supporting Trump, Trump doesn't give a shit about these folks. And he's just manipulating and using them. And, you know, who, who said it? Was it P.T. Barnum that a sucker's born every minute in this country? And, and they know that. So it's easy to manipulate 
people. Um, I know I'm going off on a little tangent, but we need real actual justice, but we also need to continue to bear witness in the art to let people know what's happening because the art is a reflection of the times. So we're like griots, you know, in the African tradition, you know, who carry on the stories and the legacies and the histories of the people in the times that it takes place. Um, and as Baldwin always talked about, it's always, it's about bearing witness. I am witnessing this and I will testify. I will speak out, I will profess. So we need both, I think, um, Allison. <clears throat> wonderful. Um, thank you all so much for your wonderful questions. Tony, that was a, an amazing reading. Um, I, I've been to a lot of Zoom readings. That was by far the most dynamic and engaging reading I've been to. That was, it was really wonderful. Very, very um, I, I wanted to read a more personal poem but I, I was looking at the clock and I was like, oh no. We've got time. To... <laughs> we've got time. You want to read it? We've got the time. Okay, I, I'll read two. Two, yeah. All right, this is from my book. Uh, um, my old man was always on the lamb. Let's see. I'm trying to find the poem that I wanted to read. Uh, okay. This is called I Was Born on a Saturday Night. My mother drops me from her womb like a bad habit, as if to regurgitate. I leave a bad taste in her mouth. Leak out like a red drop on white cotton drawers, her first menses. Stale warm water from her ear as if emerged from a swim or a shower. I lie in the maternity ward, a wet raisin soaked in blood and feces, high on heroin and Marlboro cigarettes, high on beer and wine and saturated foods, unable to scream, cry, or wince. My mother is nervous. She is freaking out. Her womb pulling at her ribs like cobwebs. My mother can't take it, can't take me. She has to get up, get out, stick a needle in her thigh. I am a dry prune, hairless in a bassinet, a purple blue dot in a pale green hospital room. My mother jumps up covers her open wailing womb, refuses to look at me writhing there like hairballs and dust on a wicker broom, puts on her coat over her gown and with her yellow smiley face disposable foam hospital slippers, runs through the shitty snowy streets of the South Bronx off to get her Saturday night special. And so this last one, um, or this next one, is called Arrival. <clears throat> and so, um, you know how they had crack babies in the 80s? Well, I was a, a, a heroin baby, basically, because my mother was on a heroin at the time that I was born. And they had to put me in an incubator. And the doctors didn't know what the hell to do. They didn't know what the hell was going on. And my mother was trying to, like, you know, she didn't want to get in trouble with the police or whatever, so she wasn't saying anything. And so um, I was taken uh, by the state and put into a foster home. So my first two years was with a white family in Queens, New York, system until my mother, my father's mother, uh, fought and got custody of me. And she convinced my mother that she would be a better caretaker of me. And so um, I would see her in these long stretches of time every now and then growing up. And so like 11, 15 year intervals. And so um, once we finally connected when I was adult and I was living out here in the DC area and, and working and stuff like that, 
she was in a situation where she had to be um, taken care of. She was going to be abandoned. So as I was abandoned as a child, uh, I turned around and didn't do that to my mother. And so this, this poem is the story of all that. It's called Arrival. Steroids turns my mother's hair from black to white in less than a year. My mother's family would have loved that to happen to the skin my sister inherited from her father, an anonymous black doctor donor from Baltimore my mother got with to feed her fix. My sister's voice and my mother's colliding in my head as I think about the July day I picked my mother up at Reagan National. She left her common law husband after 30 years. He'd leave her home tied to an oxygen tank and go off to Puerto Rico and take up with another woman who could cook and clean and cater to his needs. Everything my mother did for him and work at Walmart and clean office buildings on the side where she thinks she got pulmonary fibrosis inhaling chemicals for 20 years, scarring her lung tissue into dry sponges. He kept pushing her to sign away her half of their house. A broke down aging narcissist finally met his match. He must have forgotten that she was, a, that she was street smart and he a compromise with her ego how a woman settles for a man out of some survival instinct. I can't believe I allowed this man to keep me from my daughter for all these years, she tells me. You lost a lot of time, I say, trying to return my sister's favor and bring them back together. Curbside at U.S. Airways Arrivals Terminal, my mother's in a wheelchair looking tired and helpless, an airline oxygen tank strapped to the back of the wheelchair. She's in a white and blue flower print blouse and navy knit slacks in the white shoes of someone that lives on an island near water and sun. I hand her a yellow bouquet and a green oxygen tank to add to her great escape curbside wheelchair portraiture. Within a week, she's in the ICU at Bethesda General holding the hand of a dying woman, 20 years her senior, assuring her everything's going to be fine, just fine. Her life continuing to be a Fellini film, even as it rolls on to the credits and the word Fini. Months later, I'm wheeling her around the mall, the rehab center's wheelchair, giving my 40-year-old back a first-time golfer's workout. The nurse on graveyard shift who pumps her full of steroids and late night diabetic snacks says to me, she's gained a few pounds. I want to say no shit. Instead, I say, yeah, and her hair is getting whiter. I'm taking her out on the town to get her hair cut and nails done. Then a rare picture together and then a late lunch. All the shrimp I'm allergic to she can eat. I'm toasting her girl's night out with a glass of red wine. And in the middle of our dinner, her oxygen tank runs out. I'm off to the parking lot, trying not to panic. I come running back to the table with the second, trying to figure out how to work the valve. Somehow, the gods have aligned themselves on this sunny September Saturday afternoon. I used to work at a hospital, the way it says, teaching me the righty-tighty, lefty-loosey routine. My mother's breathing, never skipping a beat. In a couple of months, we will sit down to have our first Thanksgiving together, where she will tear up the duck, unlike an old woman with a bad heart, diabetes, problems, bronchitis, and a third lung capacity. But she paces herself, and burning logs in the fireplace light up her face. She finally tells me what happened the night she gave birth to me. How the doctor was without answers to why I was so sick, screaming uncontrollably from the womb of an incubator. I finally broke down and told him I was on drugs, she says. I was scared, but I had to tell him. I didn't want anything to happen to my beautiful baby boy. Relieved, the doctor turns and tells her, thank you, Miss Gonzalez. You just saved your son's life.
That was wonderful. Uh, th thank you, thank you so much for for coming. Uh, uh, we all appreciated it, and and uh, and and there's a recording too, so we're going to send that to you so you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, right. share it. And and we're hoping to get this up in the English department website and, and too. So uh, thanks up everybody for coming and uh, uh, take take care. Are you able to share the chat? Are you able to say the, share the chat remarks?